Welcome everyone to the Thermographic Diagnostic Imaging and Health Through Awareness webinar. Thank you for your patience. We were experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties, but we've got it all worked out and we're ready to get started. My name is Leisha Getson and I will be your host. Before we begin, just a little housekeeping. The presentation will be about 50 to 60 minutes followed by Q&A. You should be able to hear me and the speaker as well as follow the PowerPoint presentation. To the right of your screen, you'll see a chat box. If you have a question, please type it in and submit it, and we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question for some reason, you can forward it to tdi at comcast.net, and we'll forward it off to um, Dr. Liu, or uh, maybe you'll be able to just send it directly to him. If for some reason you get cut off from the webinar, you may be able to log back in and fast forward to catch up, but don't worry, all the presentations are archived, so uh, tonight's presentation will be archived on, the web on our website in a couple of days, and that's www.tdinj.com. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm very, very thrilled to be able to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Lou Travato. Dr. Liu is a 1982 graduate of Temple University School of Dentistry. He has attained fellowships in the Academy of General Dentistry, the American Academy of Cranial Facial Pain, and the International Congress of Oral Implantology. He is an accredited member of the IAOMT, that's a mouthful, past president of the Pennsylvania Cranial Mandibular Society and a graduate of the American College of Integrative Medicine and Dentistry School of Integrative Biological Dental Medicine. Uh, Dr. Liu is also a graduate of the American College of Integrative Medicine and Dentistry School, oh, the School of the Integrative Biological Dental Medicine. And he's also the owner and senior doctor at the Meeting House Dental Care, a biological dental practice in Hatboro, Pennsylvania. Uh, and what, what can I say other than um, the best compliment or the, the best endorsement I can give is uh, that my husband and I go and see Dr. Liu if we have any sort of dental issue. Um, he's the person that I would recommend to my family and friends. And um, I only wish that we had found him years earlier. Um, and I also want to say what a relief it is now because many of you know we do dental thermography and it's been a, in a, a real struggle finding someone uh, that understands thermography and that is willing to work with the patients. And uh, Dr. Liu is that guy. So um, I'm just so happy that we found him and I'm so happy that he's uh, uh, presenting this information this evening. Dr. Liu, welcome. Thank you, Alicia. That was very nice. I appreciate that. You're welcome. So we're so excited to hear what you have to say. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I put together a program here that uh, hopefully, you know, people can get a better understanding of biologic dentistry, and uh, hopefully, I can give you some resources to do your own due diligence and uh, you know make your own decisions about these things. But uh, I think when we get through here, um, you'll you'll have a pretty good understanding, and um, I think you'll you'll appreciate, I guess, the um, the necessity and uh, you know what we do as as um, biologic dentists and unfortunately there's not many of us but the ones that are out there are uh, you know really trying their hardest to do the best for their patients that's for sure yeah would you like to get started yes, we yes just jump sure right let's, in? Okay, yeah, so go ahead let's get started let's, yeah. let's get into this um <clears throat> biologic dentistry it's also known as holistic integrative or alternative dentistry and i guess in a in a nutshell it recognizes that the mouth is a vital component of the whole body and you you would think that that would be common but it's really not you know, dentists are not focused on uh, on the rest of the body, they're focused on teeth. And as a result, they, they really are, are, are rather focused on structure and building teeth. And I think as a, a holistic or an alternative dentist, we have more of a focus on toxicity and biocompatibility rather than structure. And that's kind of an important component of how we treatment plan and what we do. Um, so I guess, you know, a perfectly simple question here would be, why would you need biologic dentistry? And I think if you turn to all our alternative or integrative medical doctors, um, you'll find that many of them will attribute a lot of the immune system deterioration directly to dentistry. Um, the first cause, you know, that they'll they'll point out is the heavy metals. You know, this is kind of the elephant in the room, the amalgams, 
the uh, porcelain fuse, the metal crowns, the bridge work, um, you know, some of these things are not healthy and, uh, you know, they can cause some major dysregulations to, uh, you know, the systemic system. You know, the second thing that they identify is oral infection and, um, you know, periodontal disease, reinfected root canal teeth, infected jawbone sites. Um, and again, these things can be very uh, disruptive to a system. If you, uh, if you quote some of these, uh, he insists that dentistry must clear the toxic burdens on the immune system before healthcare practitioners can even address illness effectively. Uh, one of his quotes is, if you see many doctors for your condition with an unsuccessful diagnosis and treatment, your mouth may be the missing link. Mm. And not many people look that way. You know, when you're talking to doctors and you're going through your blood tests and you're getting all this information back and nothing seems to be working, Sometimes you have to just stop and say, hey, we might have missed it, you know, and the missing link really for many of pe these people are the mouth. And right. yeah. Dr. Klinghart and Dr. Rao, uh, I mean, these are very famous alternative medical doctors. Um, you know, they really emphasize the priority of dentistry. Dr. Klinghart has said 80% of patients' health problems can be partially traced to the mouth. Wow. And I think one of the most powerful ones really is Dr. Rao's uh, quote, and he has been quoted to say, if I had to choose between medical and dental for our patients, I'd eliminate the medical side for in our experience, no one can overcome chronic health problems without biologic dentistry. And that one was the one that hit me. I mean, wow. that, that's, that's a pretty profound statement. That's very um, powerful. So, you know, from a, from a dental perspective, uh, it, it really changes a lot of how you, how you look at things. Um, it's no longer all about teeth. You know, it's really right. about overall health it's a systemic right i mean Absolutely. if there's if there's a dental infection then it, there's a systemic problem it's not local exactly right it's and systemic. the body is it true that the body cannot clear a dental infection not oh, easily so? yes. not easily you know i use the analogy a lot with patients is it's like a sliver i mean you can put you know salve on it and antibiotics but until you, until you pull that sliver out it's not getting better mm -hmm. and that's sometimes really how we approach root canals and things of that nature which we'll talk about but okay. you know one, one of the things that you know really um is, is a question that people have is what should i expect from a biology dentist you know and what i would say you know, if, that, if that question was posed to me is you know, I would, I would hope that a biologic dentist would blend traditional standard of care dentistry with a biologic whole body approach. And I call it standard of care plus. You know, we do everything that a normal allopathic dentist would do, just a little extra. And we inherently know that unhealthy teeth, jaw bones, periodontal tissues, poor structural relationships of the jaw can cause profound dysregulation and health issues. And you also, we have a focus, like we said earlier, on toxicity and biocompatibility, not just on structure. Um, I wrote that in their molar mechanics because it's kind of a little bit of a joke in, in the alternative world because, you know, what we're taught in, in dental school is to fix teeth. And when your focus is sheerly on fixing teeth, and again, we call them molar mechanics, you know, you're looking at the structure, so you're gonna use things that are gonna be structurally sound, like metal. And unfortunately, some of the metal that we would put in people's mouths is very unhealthy. And, you know, the main one, again, is, is mercury and things like nickel and stainless steel. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things that would, would cause some dysregulation. So we try to stay away from that as much as we can. Another question people may have is, how do you find a biologic dentist? Well, in my opinion, there's really several sources. The IOMT, IAOMT. International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology has a wonderful website. You can go on there and type in your e or your uh, zip code, and it will give you a list of dentists within 50 miles, 100 miles, 200 miles. Uh, IABDM, which is the International Academy of Biologic Dentistry and Medicine, has a similar website. The Holistic Dental Association does the same thing. Um, the International Association of Mercury Safe Dentistry, that's a wonderful website by, um, I think that's uh, Tom McGuire. Um, a lot of information on there. Uh, he also has, uh, you know, a way to get in touch with dentists in your area. DAMS, which is the Dental uh, Amalgam Mercury Solutions, um, they have, you call them and they'll, they'll give you names, um, you know, and the Consumers for Dental Choice with uh, their ToxicTeeth.org. These are all wonderful, wonderful resources to, uh, to be able to find a biologic dentist in your area. So hopefully everybody got a chance to either jot some of those things down, but I know you can come back to this later on. Right. And, uh, this will be archived on our on the website, so people will be able to go back. That's a wonderful uh, list of resources. Dr. Lou, we're just having a li little bit of a sound issue. Okay. I don't know if 
um, your headset is on. I know you have got it on. Maybe yeah. just adjust the mic a little bit, just it's a little bit muffled. A little muffled? Is this better? A little bit. I don't know if my speakers are, are down. Let me turn the sound up here. Um, is that any better? Yes, that is better. Yes, okay, thank yeah, you. My, my sound was down. I'm sorry. Okay. Actually, let me turn it up a little more. There we go. Okay. So, you know, the next slide here really is when you're interviewing dental offices, and I, and I would highly recommend you do this, um, you know, don't take it for granted that they're completely alternative. Some people say they're alternative. They, they may use it as a marketing tool to get patients in the door. But when you go in there, they're doing things that may not be in the alternative spectrum. And, you know, some of the things you may want to ask is, you know, do you have safe removal of mercury fillings? Do you use protocols and technology that meet the biologic dental industry standard. I mean, I think of anything that a biologic dentist would do, they would want to protect their patients from mercury. And, you know, that's, we'll get into that in a little bit about safe protocols, but that's a simple question you could ask any dental office. And if they don't have a plan or a protocol, you may not want to go there. Also, they want to, you, you want to make sure that they use biocompatible dental restorative materials like fluoride-free, bisphenol-free, metal-free. Like we talked about earlier, you know, metal is not necessarily a good thing in the mouth. It, it really disrupts a lot of systems. So we want to stay as metal-free as possible. Uh, proper extraction protocols for toxic teeth, do they take them out correctly? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, if they recommend root canals, which I don't, but some practices do, do they do biologic root canals using laser and ozone? Um, non-surgical and, if necessary, surgical treatments of jawbone cavitations. Now, when I say non-surgical, in my practice, I try to keep things as, as conservative as possible. So keeping people away from a knife is, is always a good thing because healing and trauma are certainly not necessarily good for the system. So non-surgical approaches with ozone and things like that are certainly available to people. And obviously having some cranial mandibular uh, TMJ services is, is something that would be nice. Not everybody does, but it would be nice. So they're, they're kind of the, in a nutshell, what a, a, an alternative office should provide. Now, well, see what's happening here. I'm not moving forward. Okay. There we go. I got there it. Go. Mm -hmm. um, to simplify this, I, I have these three basic questions. Actually, if you look at them, it's actually four, but what is your stance on mercury? Now, if they answer that question, well, mercury is fine. Well, I, I would have a problem with that. What is the second question there would be, what is your mercury removal protocol? We talked about that. If they have none, I would be wary about that. Does your office use fluoride? If they say, oh, yeah, fluoride's free, well, I think if you do your research and you realize that fluoride is a toxin and it may not be something you want to use on your child because it may inhibit their, their thyroid, maybe that's not an office you want to go to. Uh, and what is your opinion of root canals? If they say root canals are perfectly fine, well, I would beg to differ, and I have research to show you later about that. So the answers to these three basic questions to tell you all you really need to know about the practice. So that's a very easy way to interview a practice and not be invasive and uh, I cannot be argumentative. It's just a matter of what are your feelings about these things? And their answers should be very telling about what they do and how they practice dentistry. This is a cute little thing somebody sent me is why, why we're, are we not supposed to take toxic <laughs> levels of mercury? So, yeah, you gotta, you gotta know oh. that's out there. Um, oh, that was Mike Adams. I hear it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, let's talk about amalgam right now. Um, you know, the term silver fillings, I think, is a, is a real disservice because they are 50% mercury. And if that's the highest amount of metal in there, they should be called mercury fillings. But I think if anybody said, I'm going to put a mercury filling in somebody's mouth, they probably would be a little taken aback. So a silver filling is a little kinder, gentler, politically correct way to say it. But it's 50% mercury, and that's pretty much across the board. There's some copper, there's some silver, some tin, and some zinc, which gives you the term amalgam. Um, what you have to understand, and this is pretty much straight up, mercury is the single most non-radioactive toxic element on the planet. And the only thing more toxic than mercury on the planet is plutonium. And if you understand what happens in a hospital setting, if a mercury thermometer was ever dropped, now thank God we don't have mercury thermometers anymore, they're all digital, but when a mercury thermometer was dropped, they would close down the, the hospital, they would bring a hazmat team in, and they would clean that mercury spill up. But we can put this in somebody's mouth two inches from their brain, and it really, it's okay. And then if anybody can explain that to me, I would be happy to listen to them. The recent studies suggest there are no 
thresholds below which some adverse effects happen with mercury. So when I hear people say I had a chelation test and I'm, my mercury is within normal limits, I kind of chuckle to myself because there is no normal limits. There is no threshold that mercury is okay. So understand that when you're talking about how much mercury is left in your system. So this is a really interesting, um, if you ever get a chance to Google tooth or the smoking tooth, uh, the IOMT did this with a 50-year-old filling in a tooth that was extracted 15 years ago. And they would scratch the surface of this. And what you see coming up there, I don't know if, can you see my arrow on the screen? Yes, we okay. can. This, this is mercury vapor coming off of this tooth right here. And the ADA says after 50 years, there would be no mercury enough in that tooth because it all outgassed. But it doesn't, and it isn't, and it's still there, and it's and it's easily removed out of there just with minor scraping. I think what they use is an eraser, you know, and they just touch the surface with an eraser. But what you have to understand is amalgams outgas approximately one microgram of mercury per surface per day, and we just established that there are no limits of mercury that are healthy. Wow. That's so, so frightening. People will say to me, well, how do I keep it under control? And, and this is kind of a joke. I'm doing this a little sarcastically, but if you don't want mercury to come off of your merc or, you know, mercury outgas from your mercury fillings, then don't chew gum or food. Don't grind your teeth. Don't consume hot liquids. Don't whiten your teeth. Don't consume acidic foods. Don't have your teeth professionally clean and don't brush them. So you can understand that <laughs> what you do in your everyday life is eliciting mercury vapor. So it's a problem. And wow. you know people uh, have to be aware of this. Now, once stimulated, the mercury continues to be released for at least an hour and a half. That's from the IOMT's website. And uh, you know that's the research on that. And uh, again, that's a little scary when you really think about this. So the 80-20 rule basically tells me that 80% of the population can handle it because they're they're healthy individuals, they have a good genetic makeup, and their, their immune system is okay. But there's 20% that cannot, and some of them experience mercury acutely and adversely. And we see a lot of patients now who are becoming much more militant about this because of the damage that was done to them. And they're, they're now picketing, and they're going to governmental sources, and they're really it's not grassroots that much anymore. We're really seeing some, some, some people who are... Uh, out there, you know, and, and they're not shy about it. You know, dentists can't do this because if dentists are caught with these types of signs, we'll lose our license. So we have to be much more careful about how we talk about mercury, but these mm -hmm. people have nothing to lose. Right. And quite frankly, they lost a lot, you know, as far as their health goes. So understand that this is not something that's, that's under the rug anymore. People are becoming much more aware of it. So, you know, in addition to the emission of mercury, we also have a problem in the mouth where you have dissimilar metals. We already showed you that, uh, that amalgams are several metals. And when you put several metals together in a, an acidic environment, which we call saliva, you get a battery effect called a galvanic action. Saliva is an electrolyte. It's conductive. It's inherently acidic because it's the beginning of your digestive process. So having acidic saliva is completely normal. You have to understand, too, that every tooth in the mouth is a living organ. It has a natural low-level electrical charge because the body itself is bioelectric. But the galvanic action with these metals in there release high levels of electrical charges that interfere functions of the body. The cellular communication is to be exact. And the electrical path that exists between the fillings or the porcelain crowns or the metal in your bridges or the braces on your teeth in a tooth and the natural fluids in the tooth around and under the filling are released and run straight to the brain. It's the path of least resistance. So when the charge is, star, is stored in a filling or a crown, it can be measured. And we do this on every new patient. We have a, uh, we have a machine called a potentiometer, and this is what it looks like. In every new patient, we test their galvanic charges on their crowns, on their, on their bridges, on their implants, on their mercury fillings. And what that does for us is it gives us a protocol, gives us a syntax of where do we start. Obviously, the ones with the highest charge causing the highest disruptions are the ones we want to start with. So that's how one of our little ways of uh, figuring out which tooth or which, uh, which crown we're going to remove first or whatever. But understand this also. That galvanic action between, say, a porcelain metal crown, which may be gold, and the mercury silver mm -hmm. filling increases the potential for that galvanic action. And that galvanic action will actually increase the release of mercury. So we've got a, a, a circle here that's really getting convoluted because the galvanic action causes more mercury release, and the mercury is causing more galvanic stuff. So 
it's a problem. And, yeah. you know, people don't realize this because it's such a low level type of thing. And it's, it's kind of the frog boiling in the water, you know, and you don't notice right. it until it's too late. Yeah. So wow. this is also something that I want to go through quickly here because again, being a little tongue in cheek about this, people will say, you know, what are the, what are the symptoms of mercury poisoning or what are the symptoms of this galvanism? And I answer everything. That's my answer. There's really nothing on the list. It's not something you, you just make something up. You can say my toe hurts. Well, that could be mercury toxicity because this is just a partial list. And I'm going to go through this quickly so you can okay. see what's going on here. But it's, you know, things like tremors and palpitation and frequent headaches, tingling in the lips, uh, inflammation in the mouth, um, ulcerations, bleeding gingiva, uh, metallic taste, inflammatory, inflammation of the kidney. How about bedwetting? Is that an interesting one? Wow. Um, you know, abdominal cramps, uh, blurred vision, dizziness, sinus congestion, persistent cough. That's an interesting one. Let me go back to that. Yeah. When I was really having a hard time with my mercury, um, I remember this like it was yesterday, but I had this, this little tickle in my throat all the time. I was always like, <coughs> you know, and, and mm -hmm. people would like, what's the matter with you? But I didn't realize it. You know, even being a dentist, I didn't realize it, you know, until I really started to look much, much closer in my blood work. But the persistent cough, allergies, insomnia, fatigue, you, you get the point here. I mean, wow. I can go on and on. Yes. This. But these, these, yeah. these are, this is a partial Antisocial list. Antisocial behavior. Exactly. Wow. Mental about confusion. That. Yeah. Think about that. You know, because, you know, there is a big joke in dentistry, you know, that we have the highest suicide rate. Well, right. why do you think that is? I mean, the yeah. two plus two equals four here, you know. Yeah. Me mental confusion, Alzheimer-like symptoms. I mean, this is crazy. So, yeah. Can I ask you a question, Dr. Sure. Lou? I hate to interrupt you, but why on earth did they ever start using mercury? It's cheap. It's the cheapest common denominator. I mean, it's still being used in dentistry today. There's still about 50% of the dentists in, in the United States anyway that still use mercury. And, you know, again, I don't want to get political about this because I just want to, you know, state the facts. But the right. point is that they use this on the on the, on the percent of the population that is the poorest. And wow. you're seeing it in Indian reservations and in welfare clinics. It's terrible. And, and the problem for me is these are the patients that are going to get sick later on and who's going to have to handle that. You know, right. I mean, right. there's there's a, you want to be cheap about this and put the, the least common or the least expensive materials into these patients' mouths, but then you're going to pay for it double down the road, you right. know, as these yeah. patients age right. and get sick. Right. But this is something that I think everybody on the call needs to really comprehend and understand. Within standard of care of dentistry right now, a dentist cannot, they cannot suggest that taking out a mercury filling will help you as far as your health. If you don't like the look of it and you want something that looks more like a tooth and not a silver filling, well, that's perfectly okay in dentistry. But if you were to say to somebody as a dentist that this is going to help your MS or your ALS, you can lose your license. And I think any dentist who does that probably should really rethink his, his, his approach because you can't promise anything with these things. I tell my patients, all we're doing is unburdening the system. We're, we're just taking away a known toxin so that you can hopefully go down the road of health and be be healthy better and, and your practitioners can help you better. But if you wish, if you wish for a dentist to address your amalgams, you have to ask and you have to make an elective procedure. You can't request it because of health reasons right now because it's just a malpractice situation and dentists are very, very attuned to this. So I just want everybody to kind of understand that. But so they can they can advertise, they can advertise safe amalgam removal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely, because that's what we're going to talk about now. That's a different problem. That's a different situation. How we take it out under safe protocols is is absolutely paramount. I would I would not have your mercury fillings removed unless they were done under safe protocols. We're going to go through it right now. Okay. <clears throat> now, different dentists and different um, alternative dentists are going to have different protocols, but they have to at least have the basic technology to help you not get a dose of mercury when you have these things removed and we'll go through it right now so for the dental team for me for my staff for my assistant who's sitting next to me we wear a mask we wear basically what looks like a world war ii gas mask that's what wow. it looks like and that protects us those things on the end will will actually grab the mercury particulate 
Um, how I got sick with my mercury toxicity early on is I used to use those small little 3M masks, which mercury would break through, and I breathed it every day for 25 years. And wow. And eventually got sick. So for the patient safety, though, we go through a lot more. And let me show you this. So this is an obvious one. You should be wearing this in any dental practice, you know, in case anything comes flying out. But you're going to be wearing some, some eye protection. We have all our patients rinse their mouth with a charcoal slurry. And the charcoal slurry basically is just um, an absorbent material to keep the mercury debris from absorbing into your oral tissues. Um, that's what it looks like. We buy it in bulk. It looks a little gross. It's a black liquid, but it doesn't taste like anything. It's very, very bland and very elegant. Um, you're going to have a nose hood which creates a unidirectional flow. That's what it looks like. It covers your nose so you can't get a whiff of the mercury vapor. Hmm. In the mouth, now I'll stop here because a lot of people will, will talk about a rubber dam. Now, I personally have a problem with the rubber dam because most of the rubber dams are latex and what we found that is mercury goes right through latex. There's no protection with latex gloves or latex dam, so it's useless. If you're gonna use a dam, you have to use a vinyl dam. And you know most alternative dentists will understand that, but uh, allopathic dentists will not, and they'll try to use a latex dam, and it doesn't have any effect of it on 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 the mercury protection. But over and above that, it's hard to seal it, and you can't get the particulate from harboring underneath it. And underneath the rubber dam is usually sublingual, where there's a very good shot right into your system. So I'm not a fan. You know what we use is something called an isolate. The isolate isolates the tooth that we're going to work on. If I bring my uh, my pointer over here again, this is basically a tongue protector. This is the cheek protector. And you can see these little openings here. This is suction. And when we put this in the mouth, the suction actually protects the vapor from going down your throat. So you have suction in the mouth and you have a protection on your nose. Now, what we do after that is we bring over what we call an IQ air, which is basically an air purifier that we um, we made into a dental unit that has this little uh, elephant tube and that sits right under your chin. My joke to my patients is that this is the patient in the waiting room protection. This is so no mercury leaves this room, you know, and this will suck it all up and it has a five mercury HEPA filter in there that cleans the air and it comes out clean at the bottom. Wow. Now we have ionizers in all the rooms and, uh, you know, uh, this is kind of overkill, but we do it anyway because it's part of the protocol. But what it does is it creates a negative ion field above the chair and the negative ions will basically attract positively charged entities. And most of the, most of the bad things like viruses, fungus, bacteria, uh, hydrocarbons, elemental metals are all positively charged and they're immediately neutralized in this negative field. It's a really neat little thing. This is NASA stuff. And uh, if I bring my pointer over here, this is the negative ion producer. These are the positive charges. So it starts here and it runs across the chair and it goes into here. And anything that happens to float up into this ion field will be neutralized. And it's actually a really neat uh, way to keep your, wow. your operatory healthy. Um, we also use a very small bar. You know, the small bar, it just allows us to chunk the amalgam. You don't want to brush amalgam out. You want to get it out as quickly as possible. And um, it goes very fast. I mean, I, I if it takes me more than two minutes to get a filling out, it's too much. Um, we use ozonated water on all our drills because the ozone is actually a very potent antibacterial antiviral. But it keeps the debris down more than anything else, keeps the vapor under control. So this is what it looks like. When you're sitting in a chair, you have your isolite in, um, the suction's in there, you're protected, you have your air back over here. Um, my, my assistant has her suction right on top of my handpiece. So there's very little vapor that escapes this environment. So when patients are concerned about getting mercury you know, in their system, I can almost guarantee with this type of protocol it won't happen. So it's, it's a very safe protocol. And this is what it looks like a little further away. This is our masks and uh, this is my assistant Kelly. And, you know, we're just doing our thing. This is what we do every day. You know, wow. it's, uh, this is our job and this is our, our calling right now. So that's the basic, uh, you know, basis of safe amalgam removal. Now, before I move on, I'll just say something because I hear it all the time. You'll see in advertisements, mercury free. Many, many dentists are mercury-free because they don't use mercury in their practice. But mercury-free and mercury-safe are much, much different things. You know, So you have to ask the questions. Do you have a protocol? This is our protocol. And if they're not doing something even close to this, you might want to find somebody else. So mercury-free means nothing. Mercury-safe is very powerful. Um, oh, 
when I see this picture, I always think of this far side joke. It always cracks me up, you know, open up Mr. Stevens. Just out of curiosity, we're going to see if we can cram in this tennis ball because <laughs> when, you, when you look at the person, you think, how can I possibly fit anything more in there? Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of equipment there. It is. But the funny thing is it, it, it's not that uncomfortable. I mean, people right. really, they don't have a hard, hard time with this, right. and, and yeah. they know they're being protected. Right. We'll yeah. look at a quick clinical case here just so people can understand. This is very typical. This is an old mercury filling. Um, the tooth is fractured around the filling, and that's very typical because the mercury expands and contracts in there just like a thermometer. It creates stress fractures. So you'll see a stress fracture and a tooth will break. So what we do is we remove the mercury, we clean it all up, and in our office we have a procedure called a CIRAC. And what we do is we make a little piece of porcelain and we put it in the tooth. And this is done in about an hour, hour and a half tops. And it's start to finish. You have no temporary, you have no impressions, you don't come back, you don't get numb the second time. And there's before and there's after. And, um, you know, this is basically what we do, like I said, on an everyday basis. This is the dentistry we do. Yeah. And it's wonderful. So, no metal, all porcelain, um, one and done, no coming back. It's actually a very nice thing. So, that's mercury. Now, and I know you requested this formulation. Yes. This is a very well, this is, this is a big question. <laughs> this is everybody's question. So, <laughs> Exactly. Well, that and along with the safe mercury removal. So yeah, I, I appreciate that. That Those visuals were, that's fantastic. So oh, I appreciate that. See, it's important. You know, yeah, they have an idea of what it's going to look like. What you're getting yourself into, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to root canals, this is a very, very controversial subject. And I, I, I really hope that everybody that has a root canal in their head does their own due diligence and studies up on this and learns. Because what you have to understand is root canal teeth are dead organs, okay? They have a lymph, a blood, and a nerve supply that's removed. And nowhere else in the body do we keep dead organs, all right? So understand that, number one. Now, the second problem is every, well, even the best endodontist cannot clean the microscopic accessory canals. Bacteria get trapped in there, okay? And those things can sit really for a long time without becoming a, a, a noticeable pain issue. But if somebody's gonna have a root canal done, hopefully the biologic root canal with ozone and laser can help clean those accessory canals as much as possible, but it's not a guarantee that you're gonna get them all clean. And we'll see that in a second here. This is what we're taught in dental school, is mm -hmm. what it looks like. You have a nerve, you have you know, an infected nerve in here, but these, are called accessory canals, lateral canals. And you can see maybe a dozen, you know, maybe maybe 15 on here, but that's not what a tooth looks like. This is what a tooth looks like. Under a microscope, under a, a electron microscope, you can see literally millions of these little tubules. And over here, you can see more of them. And there is no possible way that you can clean every nook and cranny of them. And what sits in there is dead nerve tissue. And that's the problem because the bacteria in here, well, this is just saying that it can stay subclinical as long as your immune system stays strong. But once your immune system starts to you know, become a little bit fatigued, which in my words would be you become more toxic, you know, you have problems. And <clears throat> what happens is it's not so much the bacteria that are the problem. The bacteria, they basically will eat the, the necrotic tissue and give off a waste. That waste is what causes problems. That waste travels through the lymphatic system, it gets into the surrounding bone, and it gets into the bloodstream, and it can go to every organ and gland in your body. And what's been documented is that nearly every chronic degenerative disease has been linked to root canals, whether it be heart disease, kidney disease, arthritis, neurological problems, autoimmune, breast and prostate cancer, they've all been linked to root canals. So understand that these are a problem. And for a dentist to say it's no big deal, well, I'm sorry, but it is a big deal. And you have to know this. You know, going back to this slide here, you know, informed consent in my world would mean a discussion about this. Now, somebody may choose to have a root canal, but they should know about this. They should know that there is a, an inherent risk in here. But you know, in, in an allopathic dental office, it's a knee-jerk procedure. It's done without even a, a, a second thought, and, you know, people are suffering from this. Now, I put this on here because I think everybody should at least have a look at this. You can go online and, and Google tooth viridian chart and understand that the teeth are intimately related to every meridian in your body. 
you know, if you look across here, we have the stomach meridian, the lung meridian, and large intestine. You have gallbladder, liver, kidney, bladder. Um, you know, these are these are problem areas because you have root canals on this stomach meridian, and for a woman, this is right on the breast meridian. That's that stomach um, acupuncture meridian goes right through the breast, and this is a problem. So, you know, when you're doing thermography. You know, you're seeing a physical manifestation of lymphatic drainage and heat. But what about the energetic drainage? What about, what about the other things that happen from an uh, energetic point of view? This is something, again, is not discussed in dental school. It's not discussed in normal dental practice. So take a look at this. If you get a chance, just Google it and go over it, especially if you have a root canal. Uh, Dr. Lou, can I just interject something there? Go ahead. So... Mm -hmm. The way we started doing dental thermography was, I don't know how many years ago, I was doing a breast thermogram on a woman and there was a, a big red line that neither of us could ignore. I mean, it was so prominent and I just, I just followed it up with my camera mm -hmm. right into her mouth mm -hmm. where she had a root canal. Um, yeah. yeah, and so, you know, she went and she had it taken care of. I, I believe she had the tooth extracted, but that was the beginning of us doing the uh, thyroid dental facial studies. I think every dentist should have a thermography in their office, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, what you're doing is, is, is profound and, you know, this should be, this should be stated to the art and dentistry because, you know, we're looking at this stuff every day and not seeing it, you know, because without thermography, you would never pick that up. And, right. uh, you know, it, it's just unfortunate, but that's something that, you know, I, I feel very strongly about and you can see it a mile away with a thermography. Right. But, you know, now if you have a chronic condition, you know, you have to understand that a root canal is a get you by procedure. Maybe you're not emotionally ready to lose a tooth. Maybe it's an anchor for a bridge. Maybe you're in mid orthodontic treatment and you're not ready to lose a tooth. But you have to understand these things. And if you choose to have a root canal done, you have it done as well as you can. You know, and if anybody ever says to you, your root canal is reinfected, we're going to retreat it or we're going to do a surgical procedure. I would stop it right there and get the tooth out. The reason it's reinfected is not going to go away. It's going to happen again, and you're going to spend a lot of money. And I think that's my next picture here. These things aren't cheap. You know, root canals are very expensive. And when you do a root canal with the knowledge that you're going to lose that tooth anyway, sometimes it makes more sense and it's more financially correct to take the tooth out and put a single tooth implant in there, and you have a much better scenario, a much healthier scenario, and you wouldn't be spending the Suez Canal, you know? So, <laughs> Okay, so that's enough about root canals right now. I think we can okay. talk about them forever. I think, I think you got the point across. People need to do their due diligence. Now yeah. let's talk about, okay, you have a root canal and you want it out. What do you do? Now we'll talk about biologic extractions because extractions in dental school, and, and I think for many um, people, they probably experienced this if they had a tooth out. You go to a dentist, they numb it up, they take the tooth out, put a piece of gauze on it, and send you on your way. But there's a problem with that because all the teeth have periodontal ligaments around them. That ligament holds your tooth in there. It's a shock absorber. And if the extraction is done and that's not removed, we have a problem because what happens is that membrane, that, that, that periodontal ligament, basically defines growth limits. That's what membranes do. So if you leave the periodontal ligament in there, you'll get no bone growth into that hole. I've seen pictures of root canals, extracted teeth, two years after they're done and you can still make out where the tooth used to be and that should never happen you know the bone should infiltrate in there it should look like a perfectly healthy area but if they don't take this ligament out the body thinks that the tooth is still there and it won't regrow and it won't heal properly and even worse this periodontal ligament can harbor bacteria and toxins from these bad root canals and if it's left in there and it closes over you get what we refer to as a cavitation you know, and that word is a little controversial also, but, mm. you know, the calcium dense wall that's usually around the base of most of these old root canals needs to be cleaned up too, because that's also a barrier. What we suggest in a biologic root canal is not only do you get the ligament out, but you perforate that bone, you roughen the area, and what you're trying to do is facilitate blood flow, and you're trying to get the thing to heal, because blood and bleeding after extraction, in my mind, is a very good thing, because what you're doing is you're getting the bad stuff out and the good stuff in, and the more mm -hmm. bleeding, the better. You know, So when people say, oh, I bled for a day, I go, good. Yeah, I really got things out. 
nobody believes that that's from an extraction. Understand that, you know. So mm -hmm. yes, it's disconcerting, and yes, you don't like to find blood on your pillow, but that's the way it is if it's done correctly. So you expect to bleed a little bit longer with a biologic extraction. You know, mm -hmm. it's for the best. If you really need to stop it, you do the old wives' tale. You place a black tea bag over the extraction site, clamp down on it, and that will stop the thing. And it tracks. You'll stop bleeding within 15 minutes. So that's just a little uh, tidbit. But this is basically what we're dealing with here. This is an infected root canal. And down the bottom here is all this infected, you know, bone and, and infected tissue. If this tooth is removed and this is left down here and this heals over the top, you have basically a cavitation. Mm -hmm. And that's really not a good scenario long term for healing. I put this in here because this just happened. This was a patient that came in about a month ago. He went to a surgeon that I didn't recommend he go to. He just, it was closer to his house. So we give him the protocol and say, please be polite and ask the surgeon to follow our protocols here. Well, the surgeon did. The surgeon took the tooth out, put a piece of gauze on him, sent him on his way. Now, this is three weeks post-op. He came into my office still in pain after an extraction. Now, three weeks, in my mind, wow. you should see pink tissue. It should not be painful. It should be practically healed at that point. And you can see there's still there's still nasty tissue coming out of this yeah, hole. Now, terrible. this has to literally be open back up and clean back out that's the only way this is going to be fixed and you know my my thought is when you, you're taking the tooth out you're already numb clean the darn thing out correctly and you don't have to deal with this now this poor guy's got to go back and get it cleaned out again and it would have taken literally about three minutes to do this you know during the during the actual extraction site so understand that this is a problem for a lot of people so habitations themselves um the problem with them are is they're very hard to see on an x-ray. Now, we happen to have a cone beam in our practice, which is a three-dimensional uh, radiograph, so we can actually look at it from all different angles, and we have a better opportunity to pick it up. But understand what cavitations do. They interrupt the, act of the oxygen in the blood supply to the bone. So that creates a very a potential for a breeding ground for bacteria. The infection can stay subclinical. You may have no symptoms. You may have no swelling. You may have some temperature increase on the thermography, but it's not going to be something that's obvious to you. So, and that can go on indefinitely, but this stuff is trapped inside the bone, giving off its waste and going into the bone, the lymphatics, and sending itself off into the system. Um, Dr. Haley, who, if you ever get a chance to, you know, see some of his work, this guy is, is one of the best speakers I've ever heard. Um, he's done a lot of research on root canals, but what he found when he tests, he's a, he's a toxicologist at the uh, University of Kentucky, he's not a dentist. Um, he tested cavitation samples that were sent to him. And what he found was the toxins in these cavitations were the toxins that shut off the enzymes that create ATP in our system. So why are people tired all the time when they have mm. these problems? You know, they're not being able to create the energy in their cells because these toxins are getting into their system. Now, there's also research that shows that these toxins can synergistically combine with chemicals like heavy metals and petrochemicals and all the other environmental toxins we have to create even more potent toxins, which make you even sicker. So here you have a site in your bone that doesn't hurt. You don't even know it's there. You had a tooth out 12 years ago, and you feel awful. And there you go. You, you go to your doctor. He can't figure it out. You do your blood tests. They all come back normal. And what did we say earlier? I think Dr. Yu said, if you miss, if you're feeling bad and you're doing all the right things, you look in the mouth. And this is mm. what we find. Mm. Now, here's a term that, again, is very controversial. The term NICO is when these cavitations get painful. Okay? So when they start to hurt, the term NICO actually means neuralgia-inducing cavitatio osteonecrosis. Neuralgia-inducing is the pain. You know, that, that can be facial pain, it can be headaches, it can be phantom tooth pain. Um, there's a lot of things that happen with these NICO lesions. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia, for instance. I, have, I personally think trigeminal neuralgia is NICO lesions in wisdom teeth areas. That ah, mm, yeah. And, uh, so it's, it's that, that's a very, very painful syndrome, so it's not something you want to deal with. But cleaning these out and getting these deco lesions clean uh, certainly can help. So it's important to understand that standard of care extractions don't always result in cavitations, and not all of the cavitations become deco lesions. But what we do after an extraction is we do a post-extraction healing injection with heal products, if you're familiar with them, like Tremil, um, which obviously is for trauma after an extraction that would be very, uh, you know, 
uh, potent and, and helpful. Sometimes we use some satum products, which, uh, you know, again, I don't want to get into satum, but they're, they're isopathic remedies that help heal, especially if there's viral or fungal or components in there. We use medical grade oxygen ozone, which is very potent antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, and we do that the same day as the extraction. So it's, it's very powerful for the additional healing capacity that it gives you. Um, so where do you start with this stuff? Uh, I put some books here that hopefully people can again go do their due diligence here and they're very easy reads. Uh, a couple of them are a little more dense, but if we go through them, um, you know, Dr. Breiner uh, has his whole body dentistry, um, the missing link to pieces of better health. Um, the fluoride deception, that's a great book to understand why fluoride may, you may not want it in your water, let alone in your toothpaste and in your, mm -hmm. your soft drinks and in everything else that's in yes. you yeah, know, yeah. It, It's a tough nut, but you know, our, our country has decided that fluoride you know, is a great thing that does stick everywhere. But if you read that, you may find that it might be a little different in your opinion. But Dr. Is there, Go ahead. Is, is there any way to offset the effects of fluoride? I mean, obviously we want to avoid it, but as you said, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's, in our, it's, it's in our water supply. It's very hard. I mean, you could certainly seek out fluoride-free toothpaste. Um, you can try to filter your water, although fluoride filtration is very difficult to do. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can seek out, um, you know, soft drinks and, and water that doesn't have fluoride in it. I mean, you know, some of the things um, that are out there are a little more healthier than others. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be hidden and you're, you're going to get more fluoride and you can shake a stick at it, but, you know, do the best you can and, right. and, de and de detox. You know, that's the best way right. I can but right. Dr. Huggins' books um, are awesome. I, I recommend these to everyone. Dr. Huggins just passed away. He was uh, a gem. He, amazing fellow. So um, informed consent, you know, the hidden dangers of dental care, and it's all in your head, which is a, uh, an interesting, you know, it's titled The Link Between Mercury and Amalgams and Illness. So um, I, I would recommend to anybody to read those. Dr. McGuire's book is also a great book, Poisoning Your Teeth, uh, Mercury Amalgam Silver Fillings, Hazardous to Your Health. Um, Dr. Minnick's book about root canals, that, that's a little dense, that book, but boy, I'll tell you what, um, I don't think you'd have a root canal if you read that book. Um, earthing, you know, I think everybody's heard of earthing, you know, it's a really um, uh, interesting book on, on just being healthy in general. Dr. Tennant's book, Healing is Voltage, um, really a, another great book. He has a couple of chapters in, in the dental component of health. And again, Dr. Yu, who I, uh, I quoted earlier, uh, The Accidental Cure. Uh, a wonderful book, and he talks at length about dental, um, you know, issues and and how it's a, a, a hindrance to his potential to heal somebody. Now, um, again, this is a little tongue in cheek. Again, um, very similar to the mercury symptoms, but you'll hear dentists, especially allopathic dentists, say, "Oh, that stuff they're talking about mercury is a bunch of crap. There's no there's no research on this." Well. Mm -hmm. If you look at the IOMT website, you look at Dr. McGuire's website, I mean, all I did here was take, oh, about 90 references and put them down. So when people say there are no, you know, there are no references or there's no research on how mercury affects people, you know, you can look at some of these things and, you know, we can go through them and we can just go on wow. and on <laughs> and on and on and on. I mean, there is more research than you can shake a stick at. So understand that, you know, unless you want to put your head in the sand and ignore all this and just do dentistry the way you were taught in dental school, you'll say this is a bunch of baloney. But once you open your mind, and I tell my patients this all the time, once you know something, you can't unknow it. And that's how I feel. I mean, I learned this. I lived it. And I truly believe this stuff. And um, that's why we do what we do at our practice. Yeah. So I think that's it. Wow. That was fantastic. I appreciate um, that. I, yeah, just amazing information. And just so everybody knows, just to reiterate, this will be available on our website. So if you were frantically taking notes and, and trying to copy everything down, just be assured that it'll be on the website. You'll be able to scroll through the PowerPoint uh, at your leisure and, and get uh, right some of these information all and, and the resources. I mean, just, just the resources is priceless. Um, where people can go and, and find and read about this information? Well, I, I think, you know, most patients that come into my practice, um, you know, they're referred to me by wellness centers like yours. And they're very informed, they're very educated patients. And I, I think that's imperative, you know. 
I tell them all the time, it's not my job, you know, to really to to educate them on this. It's my job to give them information. It's their job to take that information and make logical decisions about their body. So we don't force anybody to do anything. If they're looking at me and I'm talking about their mercury fillings and they're looking at me like, yeah, I got three eyes. Well, mm -hmm. stop, you know, and you have to go home as a, as, a, as a patient and, you know, do your due diligence and understand this because I'm not going to hold you down and do this. This is not how it works. So, you know, understand that that's, um, that's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, right, people right. have to do their homework. Right, right, right. Yeah. And you have to be your own health advocate. Absolutely. You, you know, you have Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, what brought me to just share the story that brought me into your office was um, earlier in your presentation with uh, a mercury filling that had expanded and my tooth broke. Right. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't know you then. And I, I went to my, uh, I went to the dentist, and sh my tooth, what was left of my tooth, got drilled down to next to nothing. Which I don't know. I mean, I it's a weird thing, but I have, I have a, you know, like everybody, nobody wants to lose a tooth, but that was kind of traumatic, you know. Sure. And now I have this big crown in my mouth that still gives me a little bit of trouble. So what you're doing there and what is the name of that procedure again where you that, you fix that broken yeah, tooth that procedure is called an on light and on um, you know what i tell all my patients is the only crowns i do in my practice is the, the replacing of crowns where some other dentist mutilated the tooth you know so if somebody did a bad crown and i have to replace it that's the only crowns that i do because when people come in with broken teeth fractured amalgams what we do is we take the filling out we clean the site and we maintain as much of the tooth structure that's left. We don't whittle it down to a little nub like you talked mm -hmm. about. And we take a scan with our with our a machine called a CIRAC, and we create a piece of porcelain called an onlay. An onlay basically gives you the strength of a crown with the conservative preparation of a filling. And that's the easiest way I can describe it to you. So you get a porcelain filling. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why won't you just put a regular filling in there? Well, quite frankly, if you're if you're dealing with a molar, a regular filling is inherently plastic. And if you put a plastic filling in a molar where you're chewing on it, it's not going to hold up very long. You'll, you might get a year or two out of it, but it's going to break. Porcelain, and, and specifically the, the porcelain that we use because of its biocompatibility, is as close to enamel as we have in dentistry. You know, I, I tell everybody that there, there really is nothing perfect in dentistry. There's no perfect material. So this is as close as we can come to natural enamel. It has the... Uh, you know, it has the flexural strength and it, and it has the elasticity. It's very similar to enamel. So when you put it in the tooth, it feels like a tooth. Like you said, it doesn't feel like this odd contraption that somebody put in there that doesn't belong in your mouth. And that happens a lot, unfortunately, because um, crowns are a very invasive procedure. And mm -hmm. the unfortunate part is if the dentist doesn't take their time cutting that tooth down to a little nub, and they don't use a lot of water and they don't take their time with the hand piece and the drill, they'll overstimulate the nerve. And guess what the next reaction is? Oh, you need a root canal. And now the procedure starts where it's just a snowball. So you lose the tooth, you end up with a, you know, with a, a root canal, an extraction, an implant, and all this money spent when you could have just put an on in the darn yeah. tooth and you would have been fine. You know, and that's how we yeah. handle things. Yeah, I, I hear you. And that's, that's, very frustrating every time I think about that because I, I did go back and they wanted to do a root canal and I said yep. no way and that's yep. when I thank God I came to see you. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> um, a question I have is a person if a person is basically healthy and I, I think I know the answer but I'm gonna ask it anyway if a person is basically healthy and has four, four to six mercury fillings over 30 to 40 years old mm -hmm. do you recommend removing them or leaving them alone? Okay good question. My answer to that is how much poison is too much? And if you can answer that, um, we're going to write a book together. But, <laughs> you know, where is the line in the sand for you as an individual? When do you become so toxic that you get what we call symptoms? And, you know, mercury is just a toxin. Now, it's no different than the petrochemicals and the, the pesticides and the GMO food that we're eating. We're all bombarded every day with toxins. Mm -hmm. And we have to do the best we can to try to clean ourselves up. And rule number one in my mind from toxicity 
is get rid of the source. You know, if you're mold toxic and you're living in a moldy house, you have to move. You know, it's as simple as that. You can't continue to live in that moldy house. And if you're you're seeing signs or even if you're not seeing signs of mercury toxicity, you're getting doused because we saw how the mercury outgasses on there every day. And you're getting a micro dose of mercury every day. And when does it hit the line in the sand where you start to become symptomatic? So my, I guess if they're simple restorations where we're not really looking at situations where, you know, it's going to be a catastrophe and the tooth is going to fall apart and we have to do all this crazy dentistry. If it's just take a filling out, put a filling in, we got to lose. They're 50 years old anyway or 40 years old anyway. I mean, you know, they're, they're better restorations today. They're more biocompatible today. You know, there really is nothing to lose in those scenarios. So, you know, I always applaud people that are healthy and come in and want to preempt you know, any type of problem down the road. Right. And I, I pat them on the back because most of the people I see are sick. You know, most yeah. of the people that come in are already debilitated. And it's sometimes too late, unfortunately. So yeah. you're feeling good is kind of the time you need to do this stuff. Oh, that's a, that's a great point. That's a, yep, sure does. <laughs> yep. Uh, Josie says, thank you, Dr. Lou. It was great information. And she has a question. How can you tell what has been used to fill a tooth under a crown? You can't. Okay. Um, that, that's uh, it's a little bit of a Pandora's box, but when you look at a crown on an X-ray, especially a porcelain metal crown, the X-rays will not penetrate the metal. So all you'll see is the metal of the crown, a big white blob on the X-ray. And unless the dentist kept meticulous notes about what he used for what we refer to in dentistry as a buildup, you won't know. Now, how you can possibly tell is with those galvanic numbers that we talked about earlier. So when we're doing our galvanic tests and test, testing each tooth energy level, if we find a crown that just jumps out at you as far as its energy, chances are there's mercury underneath there. And that's where we have to take them off, clean them up, and put an all porcelain crown on there and have no mercury. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty conservative about that, that type of stuff. And unless I really found, you know, a, a, um, an obvious reason, I probably would not recommend you take old crowns off just because you want to see what's under them. It's expensive and it's really not, you know, it's a little overkill. I think you, you, you know, you tolerate them as long as you can. And if we're seeing all the other mercury removed and you're still having health issues, then you may want to look at the next step, which we might be taking those crowns off. But there is no way. There's no way to tell unless the dentist wrote it down in his, in his notes. And most dentists don't, you know, so oh, okay. I'm going to point hmm. that out. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Sue asks, what is your porcelain? Two of my... <clears throat> Cerex, C-E-R-E-C-S, have broken. Okay. Um, we use a product. Uh, there's actually many different products out there. We use a product called Impress, uh, which is from a company called Ivacar. And there's a, a newer block out now for somebody maybe like her that, that um, has a zirconia base in it as well as the porcelain base. And that's called Duo. And um, I would use Duo in somebody that broke one of my Empress crowns, to be perfectly honest with you. But if I, if I back up just a little bit, um, I've been doing Cerax now for probably close to 10 years. And, you know, I've made plenty of mistakes, and that's how you learn. Um, but the majority of things that break are because of operator error. And it's not the material. It's they didn't prep the tooth correctly. They left the sharp edge. They didn't check the bite properly. Um, be, and, and you ask me how I know because I've done it, you know, so, you know, nobody's mm -hmm. perfect and you make mistakes, but you learn from those mistakes and you make sure you don't do them again. So there's a very good chance that the inverse or the porcelain crowns from the Cirac broke because they weren't prepared correctly or they weren't done correctly. And, and you know, again, I don't want to bad mouth anybody, but I've done it. So, you know, that's how things are made. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Uh, one other question. When you were talking about the metals being in the mouth, and I mm -hmm. and you mentioned braces and electro something or other, are you saying that the braces are also yes. what throwing off some sort of? Absolutely. Um, you know, when you put braces on a child, um, most of the braces that are out there today are nickel titanium. Um, the wires that they put on uh, could be nickel titanium. They could be stainless steel. There's a lot of different. Uh, metals out there, but these are dissimilar metals. And when you put them in an acidic environment, you create a galvanic charge. So um, the, the, the interesting story about that is I never appreciated that until my younger son, he's not that young anymore, but when he had braces, um, 
his personality changed and it was it was frightening to be perfectly honest with you um you know this was a young kid who would walk around and shake people's hands and look people in the eye and he would swear that he was running for mayor and you know he had a great personality and never had a problem with, you know just addressing someone and they put these braces on and he became this shy introverted wouldn't talk to you wouldn't look at you and it took us a little while to realize what it was but there are ways to demagnetize those things and to actually decrease that galvanic charge um and i'm pretty because he has no amalgams in his mouth obviously mm -hmm. but i'm convinced it was the braces wow so, that's you know, very it, it's, interesting. it's pretty profound and, and it's one of those things that some people will notice it just like mercury they'll notice it profoundly and other people won't notice it at all um but and they, that could be something that that the parents would just chalk up to the child might feel embarrassed that they have braces on or something like that and they not might. They might, yeah. but, you know, what, what I would recommend is there's a couple things you can do. I mean, they have ceramic brackets now, so you don't have to have nickel titanium brackets. So you can put ceramic brackets on, and that helps. That helps a lot. You know, it's also people do that for aesthetic purposes with the ceramics or tooth color, and you don't see in this one. So, you know, that's also, they're a little more expensive, so sometimes, you know, parents won't want to pay for it, but it's going to really cut down on the galvanic charge. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about that. You know, wow. so that that's, a, that's a nice way to kind of inhibit that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm thinking when I'm talking about braces, I'm thinking of Dr. Weston A. Price's work when he did it, which he did in the 1930s, going out to the uh, indigenous tribes and, and looking at the people's teeth, right? And sure, seeing they, they had these perfect teeth, these very broad smiles that could yeah. accommodate all of their teeth. And then he makes note of their their easy reproduction, their easy, um, mild manner, their their amazing physical attributes, and as soon as um, the the uh, Western diet or the the sad diet was introduced, their teeth started. Of course, they started to have tooth decay and um, all sorts of physical problems. Then, sure. in addition to uh, malnutrition and all that sort of stuff, but then their faces started to narrow. Well, that's that's right? an interesting point. Yes, and and you know the the reason behind that realistically is the allergic response that these people had to these Franken foods, if you would. You know the right. you know the, the, they're bringing in um, you know refined sugar, refined flour that these people never were exposed to, and what happens is when you have an allergic reaction you know, and your nasal passage starts to block up, you know, you start to see a narrowing of the, of the nasal and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the maxilla. And now all of a sudden, when the maxilla starts to narrow, you start to have orthodontic problems, you know, and now teeth get crowded and you, you don't have these broad smiles anymore. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there right now who are doing a lot of work. I think Dr. Um, what was his, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Dr. Dr. Stack, Brendan Stack, did a study one time where he took patients, young kids who had very narrow arches, you know, they, they, they had um, you know, all kinds of allergy problems, ear infections, you know, all these things that were very typical of, of kids of, of that nature. And he expanded their arch, very similar to what Weston Price saw with, you know, the people with the broad arches. And one of the things they found, not only did the, did the allergies get better and the ear infections get better, but their IQ went up. Wow. And you would say, well, why would that happen? Well, they could breathe at night. You know, they were right. getting oxygen and they were right. sleeping better, you know. Right. So broad arches, wide noses. And also also the fact that they are nose breathers, not mouth breathers. Exactly. So they, they, they tilt the baby's head. For, would it be forward or they would tilt the head, baby's head forward so the baby's mm -hmm. mouth closes. So the baby right. learns to become a nose breather because... Right. Because mouth breathing, in addition to lots of other things, ha does have an effect on the IQ and the brain. Sure, and the teeth. Yeah. And, and the, the teeth, teeth, of course, because yeah. you're 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 not the saliva is not on there, yeah. and yeah. yeah. But I mean, so many kids, you know, like it's it's the fad today. Kids have braces, all different colors, and you see all of these very narrow faces and. And that's what's happening because well, we don't we, have the right nutrition. If, if we want to, um, you know, just, just throw this one thing out about orthodontics and, and any, anybody that's listening, I think they should really remember this, especially if you have children that are of that age. Um, one, of the, one of the things that is a pet peeve of mine is what they call premolar extractions. When a child comes into an orthodontist and they're too crowded, 
the knee-jerk reaction is let's take four perfectly healthy premolars out so we have room and now we can space the teeth out and make a beautiful smile. The problem with that is you're narrowing the arch. When you take four teeth out and bring the teeth together, you're narrowing the arch and you're creating TMJ issues. You're creating narrow sinuses and noses. If you expand the arch and it takes longer, it's more expensive, it's not as efficient as extraction, but it's healthier and it's the only way to go. When, when moms come in or dads come in with, with a child and says, my orthodontist wants to take four teeth out, I tell them to go find another orthodontist wow. or go to mine. <laughs> you know? Yes, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a very important point. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Anything else you want to leave us with? Oh, Dr. I Lou, we, I mean, you've given us so much. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that was a, you know, a tremendous amount of information. We so appreciate you taking the time to to spend this uh, over an hour with us and, and put this uh, fantastic presentation together for well, us. I appreciate you and, and, and Phil doing what you do. I mean, this is great that you offer this to your patients. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I think getting this information out is critical and, and allowing patients to make you know, logical decisions and do their own due diligence is the only way they can, you know, they can go forward with their health care, including their dentistry. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, next month, let's see, where are we? So next month, August, Wednesday, August 24th, uh, Dr. Michael Rothman will be presenting and uh, he, uh, he uses a true blend of traditional and alternative medicine to provide the highest quality of care utilizing natural, holistic, and non-toxic methods. He's dedicated his life to helping his patients understand the how and why of their health. He's got a book out called Etabolic Stress, How the Lies You're Being Fed Are Making You Sick. So that's Wednesday, August 24th. Please join us for that. Um, let's see. Uh, as you know, your confidence in, uh, in us is our highest compliment. If you find value in our webinars and in our services, please leave us a review. Please leave a, a review for us on Google or Facebook. And I think that covers everything. Again, uh, Dr. Lou, thanks very much. You're Thank you welcome. all. Thank you all for attending, and everybody have a good evening. Good, good night. night.